welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. This is part two of our look at cryptid toys. Before we continue where we left off in part one, here's a couple of bonus toys. First, a recent one. This was sold in stores as recently as last year. This is a big, heavy Bigfoot figure. It was sold at Toys R Us. You can still find them in independent small toy stores because the, when Toys R, Us, Toys R Us went out of business, they sold their leftover stock to small toy stores around the country. They had this and they had a, a Yeti that was white, very similar to that. And they had a couple of big play sets. So Bigfoot toys and Yeti toys were still popular right up to the present day. Uh, in these small stores, you can still find this as of this taping, you can still find these, to these toys in stores today. And they're, they're no small, uh, small toy. I mean, they're, they're a big, substantial, major toy. <laughs> Pretty cool. Now, this is a vintage toy. This is a chupacabra. This toy was made in Mexico for the Mexican toy market in the 1990s. This chupacabra, let's put Bigfoot away over here. This chupacabra is battery operated. He walks and he makes noise. I think he laughs like a diabolical laugh. Ha 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 ha. I don't remember if he says anything. And if he does, I don't remember if it's in English or Spanish. I think he just laughs or roars or both. Uh, so he's about 12, 14 inches tall. And he's a really cool toy, the kind of thing you wouldn't find in America. Very unusual. In the 90s, we're the era of the chupacabra. Just like Bigfoot is very much of the 70s, chupacabra is very much of the 90s. There's another version of this that has Herman Munster's head. I don't know why, but it's a quirky Mexican toy. I'd like to get the Herman version too, but this is more you know, authentic Chupacabra toy, so I like this version. Okay, well, now let's pick up where we left off last time. I was looking at a couple of boxes full of cryptid toys, so let's see what was I doing. So here's something Loch Ness related that is very, <laughs> very important to me. Oh dear, it's evaporating. Well, this is Loch Ness Monster Water. This was bottled in the 1970s and it contains water from Loch Ness. See the back there. Certificate of okay, certificate of authentication. It has like the little story of how they bottled it. Mystifying, frightening, prehistoric. You can see it has a picture of Nessie coming up out of the lake. Oh, that reminds me. I, can, see, I keep thinking of other things I want to bring here and show you. There's a, a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle of, of Nessie coming up out of Loch Ness and a little boat with some fishermen and they're looking at this very snake-like Nessie coming up out of the water and I have that puzzle. It's an impressive box. I really ought to go get it. But it reminds me of that because it kind of looks similar to that illustration. So when I was a kid, I read about this in a, a kid-oriented magazine. I said, I don't know what the magazine was, but there's some kind of a magazine that, because there were all these kid magazines when I was young. I'm sure there are now, but the ones I've seen in the present day don't seem like the ones I had when I was a kid. They were more newsy magazines when I was a kid. 
and they had a story about this guy who went to Loch Ness and uh, bottled this water as a kind of a novelty product. And he also went to the Bermuda Triangle, which is a pretty big area, and, and bottled water from there. So we also had Bermuda or Devil's Triangle water packaged the same way. And I remember reading about that and being very fascinated with it. And it stuck in my head throughout childhood. And then when I was an adult, I searched and searched to find one of these. And finally I did. It was in the, in the 1990s that I got this. So when I, when, I, when I did get it, the bottle was maybe two-thirds full, and now it's half full. So even though it's in this plastic, it's, the bottle has a stopper, and it's in this plastic bag, and it's in this box in the basement, still, over time, it's evaporating. So eventually, it'll be all gone. But the essence of Nessie will still remain in the bottle. Let me put this back in here. I'm interrupting the recording. I went upstairs and I got this puzzle. This is the puzzle I was talking about. I had this as a kid. This is not the one I had as a kid. This is the one I bought just a couple years ago. It took me forever to find this thing. I almost thought maybe I just dreamt it. but it took years to find one of these. You can see, well, no, you can't see in this. I don't want to spill it all over. Here's the boat I'm talking about. You can, you can barely see it. That's just the tip of it. So this boat has two guys in it and they're over here, and they're looking at this coming up out of the water. It's a really nightmarish, but also wondrous, dreamlike image. And I, I just like how it just goes on and on forever. Here's its tail here. It's this ridiculously huge thing. It's kind of bubbling here. Don't want to don't have it under these hot lights too long. This was made in 1976 by American Publishing Corporation in Massachusetts. What's this? That's another Loch Ness souvenir. It's kind of cute though. So I think, I think this is a vintage Loch Ness souvenir. I don't know if that's from the 70s or what, but I don't think that's modern. I think that's vintage. It's like a flocked material. And you see it kind of looks like that rubber jiggler that I showed you with the big round head and the goofy smile. Kind of that same idea. Oh, let's see here. So much stuff. What's this? Oh, this is cool. Here's a little monster in my pocket, Bigfoot. I don't know if you can see that. It's pretty small. I don't know if I can focus on it. It's probably too small. Um, Here's a Loch Ness Monster Cup from 7-Eleven. And they did a whole series of these cups, and I have more of these. But for some reason, the only one that I see in this box is this one, but I know I have more of these cups in this series. Okay, what's, what's this? This is kind of heavy. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, all right. This is a 
Durham Wind Up Yeti. white hair. Now a friend of mine has one with red hair and it looks more Christmassy. This is, this is white hair. My friend has red hair. It has a wind-up mechanism there. I don't know if it still walks or not. I'm not going to try it. He's got one of his little prongs broke off. He's cute. And the way they sold these was there was like a cardboard platform that it sat on and then like a clear plastic dome. Really weird kind of packaging. Oh, this is interesting. See, the more we go down in this box, the more interesting it gets. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. All right, this is a trying clockwork Loch Ness monster. So that's the box it comes in. You wind that up. and it moves around. And you can see that the Loch Ness Monster on this looks kind of like a dragon. It's like, it has like fire coming out of its nose. It's really weird. But that is a trying clockwork Loch Ness Monster. And here is what it looks like. So there's one inside that box that's never been used. And then there's this one, which I think has been used. It's pretty loose. So you can see his cute little face. He's definitely kind of a, a serpent. He's more of a serpent than a plesiosaur. And he moves around like that. And he bumps into things. He's got a little smiley face. So that's what's in this box. Another, another thing I could show you if I, I mean, well, okay, this is from the Milton Bradley Bigfoot game. This is Bigfoot, the giant snow monster game. And the way you play that is Bigfoot stomps around on your game pieces and he ejects little footprints. They're, they're little plastic disc with a footprint printed on it. And he stomps on you and if he leaves a footprint on your player, on your token, then you're out of the game. He's very cute. And I do have, I have two boxed examples of that game. This is from my childhood one, which I still have, and I still have the box and the game there. Then they, I have another I bought as an adult, which is unused. So I have both of those. And you know, that's another thing I probably ought to go dig it up and show you. I stopped the recording and I got my childhood Bigfoot game. This is Milton Bradley. I couldn't find the one I, I bought as an adult collector. It's a nicer shape than this. It's, it's somewhere out of reach, but this was handy, so I got this one. Oh, and you can see the Bigfoot flag. That's cute. Let's see how much, without ruining anything, see if I can get this. Okay. So there's the board. 
can see Bigfoot's habitat. You can roam around in there. It's got a cave. Here's the inside. Don't this stuff spill out. Let's see if I can get, find one of those footprints I was talking about. There's one. Yeah, you can see it. Try this one, camera. Let's see, I feel like we're running out of time. I want to sh make sure I can show you the best things. This is a whiskey decanter. Scotch whiskey. It's unopened, but I don't think there's whiskey in it anymore. It must have dried up. So I believe this, what is this from? Is this the 70s? Oh, this has been used. I see that it's got tape over it. 1969. 67? 69. 1969, I think. I think I have another one. Pretty sure I have two of those. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. Oh, this is, this is odd. Okay, so for a long time, people would see this figure and they would not know what in the heck that was. So people would find this figure and they knew it was the Yeti, but they didn't know, was it just sold by itself or was it part of a set? And finally, collectors figured out that it's part of a evil Knievel set, an evil Knievel play set. I don't know if it's Snake Canyon or I don't, I don't know the name, but it's, it's a, like a canyon and he has to jump over and this Yeti is in the canyon. And he's got a little hole in there where he's, in his foot where he sticks in somewhere, he fastens onto the play set. He's cute. Cute little Yeti figure. Oh, okay. That's a Bigfoot souvenir. When was, where was this from? I can't tell, but. So that's like a late 90s, early 2000s Bigfoot souvenir piece. And I have a, do I? Maybe not. They made a bigger one. And this one broke at some point, and I glued it back together. But I have another one that did not break. I don't know if it's in this box or not. Maybe this is it. Yeah, that's it. So same thing, just that one's not broken. And for whatever reason, I never got the bigger one. There's one just like that, a little bit bigger. Another Loch Ness souvenir from Loch Ness. That's 2000s, 2010, thereabouts. Um, do I want to take this out? I don't know. I guess I should. Okay. This is a Loch Ness piece. Let's see if you can see on here.
something fell down. Well, oh, there we go. When was this made? Made in the UK. So it's just a decorative cloth. It's really cool. I don't see a date on it. It's got a little bit of, I don't know, chocolate milk or something right there. So it's not completely unused, but it's a nice condition. So that that's obviously some kind of a Loch Ness souvenir piece as well, probably sold in the gift shop. Well, I'll fold it later. Yeah, it's coming together. Yeah, I'll fold it later. Okay. Uh, These are Yeti stamps. I think it's from Bhutan. Yeti stamps, and there's another one back there. Yeti stamps from Bhutan. This is the trailer for the 1970 John Carradine movie, Bigfoot. So this is a 35 millimeter print of that of the trailer from that movie. And this is something important to me. Uh, I guess I better take this out of the package here. All right. I'm afraid of getting this all dusty. No. Let's come off. Here we go. Okay, so this is <clears throat> this is the paperback of the Mysterious Monsters. So remember, I told you about that movie. There was this movie, The Mysterious Monsters, that I saw at the theater, and Peter Graves narrated it, and it had Bigfoot, Nessie, Yeti in it, and it scared me to death. And that so was this book was a tie-in for the movie. Yes, it's now a major motion picture. I don't know if this book came out before the movie. I don't think so. This book was made as a tie-in for the film. It says, Shik Sun Classic Pictures. I don't know if to pronounce it Chick or Shik. I, I think Shik. Shik Sun Classic Pictures. Right there. It's published the book. So it was made as a promotion for the film. And this looks just like the poster art for the movie, which I have the poster, of course, for the movie. But the reason that this is important, like, okay, big deal. It's the paperback promo for the movie, blah, 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 whatever. Well, the reason this is important is because this belonged to Forrest J. Ackerman. This came out of the Acker Mansion. If you don't know who Forrest J. Ackerman is, well, he was someone very important to monster kids who grew up from the late 50s through the 60s and the 70s, even into the 80s. He edited Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, and he was quite a character. He promoted himself in the magazine as Uncle Forey, and we all grew up in, in for, like, oh my goodness, uh, anyone who was a child from that period, from the late 50s to early 80s, would have known who Forrest, Jack, Forrest J. Ackerman was if they were into monsters and horror. And things that came out of his house are very special to monster collectors because he was known not just for editing the magazine, but he was a collector. So he had a house just full of monster sci-fi collectibles. And a lot of us who became collectors ourselves, kind of modeled ourselves off of what he did. So he, we wanted a collection kind of like Forsty Ackermans. We wanted, we wanted our own little Acker Mansion. Um, and yeah, that, that's part of why I have a basement that I don't show on camera. It's the basement of horror because it's so horrible I don't want to show it because it's just full of junk. Why is it full of junk? Well, it's not all because of Forsty Ackerman, but that certainly was a part of the inspiration that I wanted my own little little Acker Mansion. 
Uh, so now in more recent years, we've with the Me Too movement, there's been stories about him. I won't get into details, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's some truth to those stories. I won't say more than that. Uh, he definitely was not a perfect person by any means. He may have been less perfect than average, but he was still a historic figure in, in popular culture and I met him a few times. I actually went to the Acker Mansion uh, twice and got to tour it and, and, and meet him and talk to him. And that was a, quite an honor and, and, and quite an experience. If you were a monster kid, that was a pilgrimage you wanted to take. You wanted to someday see the Acker Mansion and, and, and meet Forey Ackerman, Uncle Forey, at the Acker Mansion. And I got to do that twice. Uh, you would go to his his front gate every, on a Saturday morning, and you would wait out there. And other people who were there for the tour started to collect, because uh, he would say he would leave a, a, a phone message that you could dial up and find out whether he was giving a tour that Saturday or not. But it was always on a Saturday. I think it was 9 a.m. You had to wait by the gate, and finally, when enough people gathered, you'd hear his voice on the intercom saying, yes, is somebody there? <laughs> and maybe one of his assistants would come out and open the gate and lead us in. And then he'd be waiting inside the house and he'd take us all through the house up and down. And we'd see all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. He had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of things in his house. Uh, he was not, uh, a good conservator. He, I mean, the stuff was not in great condition, but that's okay. I mean, it was his collection. It didn't have to be in good condition. It was his collection. He did it his way, and it reflected who he was. I think that's one of the most important things about a collection. It should reflect the collector. You should get some sense of who the collector is by seeing the collection. And so maybe they have a collection that's very small and very neat and tidy, almost eh, kind of anal perhaps. Okay, and that might tell you something about that person. Another one might have a, just a sprawling collection that's just all over the place and a big mess. I'll tell you something about them. Or they might have a big collection but it's very nicely displayed like a museum. It's big but it's displayed, it's organized, and that tells you something. And of course, what they collect, if, are they a generalist? Do they have just anything and everything? Are they very focused? Is it all from a certain period? Is it from their childhood? Is it to the modern day? Does it seem like they're collecting for nostalgia or are they more money oriented? They're collecting what they think they can sell or a little of both. There's all kinds of things you can learn about someone just by seeing their collection. What do they collect and what does their collection look like? Like my collection looks like a bunch of boxes. That probably says something about me. Probably says a lot of things about me. I don't really have it displayed. Well, so anyway, Forrest Ackerman, his collection was huge, filled his entire house, every room. It was a colossal mess. Everything was dusty and cobwebby. But it was cool. And I, I, it was a adventure meeting him at the Acker Mansion twice. I saw him at some conventions. That was, you know, that's nice, but it's not, not the same as, as going to the Acker Mansion. That was more than just meeting someone. That was, that was an experience. That's like uh, going to a landmark like the Eiffel Tower or the Pyramids or something, going to some famous landmark it's, as opposed to seeing a picture of it out or something. I mean, or, or, or meeting uh, Broadway actors, like, oh, hi, you know, nice to meet you, versus seeing them on Broadway, on stage, performing, and then getting to meet them maybe afterward backstage. You know, it's, it was more than just meeting someone. It was an experience, a round, whole rounded experience. And, well, I mean, if I, I, if I had Acker Mansion collectibles, I could do a whole hour on the Acker Mansion. I don't. In fact, I only have a couple of things from the Acker Mansion, and this is one of them. The 
novelization of mysterious monsters. So, put that right there. Put this over here. Okay, so I'm opening up another box now. Here's a whole other area. Oh my goodness. Oh, brother. Okay. Let's see. Don't want to get these dirty. I've got all this dust on me from all this stuff. Okay. Oh. All right, so this is an animal fair plush Bigfoot. And what is he from 1977? Yeah, 1977. He's an adorable little stuffed Bigfoot. Very important to me for reasons I'll talk about in a second. Another one. Hmm. You no know, two of these look alike. Here's another one. Another animal fair. Stuffed Bigfoot. Hello. There's a little tag. For some reason, he's got two bags, whereas the other one had one bag. All right, put him in there. <coughs> oh, this is Animal Fair Bigfoot Hand Puppet. Ah. It's a hand puppet version of him. He's cute. They're, they're all so cute. Okay. Here, getting smaller and smaller, here's a pair of. Come on now. Be careful now. These are little rubber jiggler <laughs> animal fair Bigfoots. Oh, you're never gonna be able to see this. Too small. Maybe, can, I don't know, if, is it focusing on that? So they're squishy rubber. So little tiny little animal fair Bigfoots. Let's keep them there. And then here, Here's a ginormous animal, animal fair big fart. Ah, there it is. Woohoo! Big one, see? And I don't have one, but they made a five foot tall one as well. Even bigger than this. A gigantic one. And I remember when I was a kid seeing the gigantic one at Toy Chest. It was a store kind of like Children's Palace or Toys R Us, but it was called Toy Chest. 
and they had the giant one up high with a lot of other giant stuffed toys in a row. And I don't know, he was probably a hundred bucks or something, some crazy price. Well, so all those are 1977 Animal Affair Bigfoots. Why is that important to me? Because when I was a wee kid, my brother and I both had Animal Affair stuffed Bigfoots just like those. And we still have them. I don't think they're in this box. I think they're in another box with some childhood toys. But we still have them. And so we had a standard size like this. Um, and one, the one, mine was, they had names. Mine was called B Foot, like initial B Foot. And Gamel, my brother, Gamel, his was GL Foot. They all had, both had initial B Foot, GL Foot. And GL Foot stood for General La Foot. He was a French general, General La Foot. And the in mine was the no nonsense one. He was like the straight man, and Gamel, my brother's, was the comedic one. So like mine was uh, Abbott, and his was Costello, or mine would be Hardy, and his was Laurel. Uh, mine didn't have a lot of imagination. He was very straightforward, strictly business. That's why he, he didn't have a. F his name was just B Foot, Big Foot. You know, it was nothing imaginative or funny because he was very straightforward and Gamel it was my brother's Bigfoot was very fanciful and out there that's why he was like a, a general not just a general but a French general and so his Bigfoot was always causing problems and getting my Bigfoot into trouble and they would go on adventures and my Bigfoot was always trying to be grounded and sensible and his Bigfoot was always goofy and causing problems <laughs> so that was our little fantasy world with these Bigfoots. And uh, I, I loved those Bigfoots. We both loved our Bigfoots. And of course I slept with my Bigfoot and he slept with his too for a while. We were still sleeping in the same bed for I think the entire time that we played with these Bigfoots. And if we went to our grandparents' house we'd take them with us. Uh, we wouldn't go anywhere without our stuffed Bigfoots. And if I watched a Bigfoot movie on TV, which is really scary, I would have my Bigfoot with me. So I mentioned Shriek of the Mutilated. I love that movie. I saw it on TV late at night when I was a little kid. And it was unedited. unedited. They didn't cut anything out of it. So if you've seen that movie, you know what I'm talking about. There's stuff that should have been cut. They didn't cut anything because it was this independent television, you know, every market had their independent stations. They would show these movies late at night. They wouldn't care about cutting it. They would just get the print, just show it. So I remember it was like a Friday, Saturday night, late at night. Well, maybe, you know, maybe it was a week, I don't know. But it was like 1 or 2 a.m. I mean, it was like, there's no way should I have been up. I don't think my parents knew I was up. But I was up watching it on this little old-fashioned TV. I was in bed and had my Bigfoot with me watching this scary Bigfoot movie. Very lurid, creepy, ultra low budget Bigfoot movie. Uh, and well, so <laughs> it was strange for a kid who was kind of scared of Bigfoot when I was a kid. I, I had almost like a phobia of Bigfoot even though I was really fascinated by it. It was kind of like Batman and his phobia of bats. So naturally he's obsessed with bats and he dresses like a bat. Well, you know, I was obsessed with Bigfoot. Yeah, I was also very scared of Bigfoot. Uh, and so my comfort animal, stuffed animal, is a Bigfoot. <laughs> and then later in life, as an adult, I made a short film called, uh, called, uh, <laughs> I forgot the name of my own movie. <coughs> The Devil at Lost Creek, there we go. I made a short film called The Devil at Lost Creek um, where I played the Bigfoot. So I mentioned Batman you know, dressing up like a bat, so I got to dress up like a Bigfoot in this short film. 
Maybe I'll put the link to the. I mean, it's if you watch, you saw my channel, my YouTube channel. You can find it. It's right there. So uh, I was a Bigfoot obsessed kid, and those animals, those animal fear Bigfoots, were really important, an important part of my childhood. And so, as an adult, I wanted to collect mint examples with a tag and everything, which I have. And I have a, a Facebook friend named Kate who sent me that big one I showed you. Thank you, Kate. That was just in the last couple of months she sent that, so very recently. And she's a big aficionado of those Bigfoots. She loves, she also grew up with those Animal Fair Bigfoots and she's just all about those Bigfoots. She loves those toys. There's a few other things in here. So this looks like a was a Zeke O'Connor, I think his name is. This was sold by Sears. This is a little Yeti, a little stuffed Yeti. And I think this is too. At the last. Oh, there's still more stuff in there. Sheesh. Okay. This is a big version of that same Sears Yeti. So this was sold at Sears. Who is the guy? Is it Zeke O'Connor? Yeah. I don't know if that pronouncing it right. It's Zeke O'Connor. So he, here's this Yeti. He's really cute, isn't he? Let's see if you can... He's got cute little feet. I like him. He's very... He's shaped like... Shaped like a Bigfoot. You know, he's got the right look. I don't want to mess up his fur. He's got really beautiful fur. I don't want to have him out get messed up. Put him right here. Okay, there's still more in this box. Oh my gosh. Disney big uh, yetis now. Wow. Okay. There's a little Disney... Matterhorn Yeti. Another one. Another Disney Matterhorn Yeti. And his foot's twisted around. I think his foot's posable, but I'm not going to mess with it. I think you can twist him. He's cool. Oh, let's see here. This has got to be another Disney Yeti. It was the same one I just showed you. Okay. Yeah, it's another example of the same one. His foot's not twisted. So, same one. He's like jointed somehow. He's plush, but he's got joints. There's like a little, like, a, like an armature in there. You can pose him. There he is. That's from Disneyland or Disney World. I don't know. Disney theme parks. So, if you've ever been to the Matterhorn, I've been to Disneyland a few times, never been to Disney World. But the Matterhorn at Disneyland. They have a Yeti that appears and rah, scares you. And I think Disney World, I think he, he, he does more at the one in Disney World. Or maybe they've got a, a new, I think they have a new Yeti themed ride. So this is, the, I think these are from the Matterhorn. I know this one is, but I think there's a new Yeti ride of some kind where he's more active, I think. When I went to the Matterhorn, he I did a couple times. He didn't really do a whole lot. He was just kind of there. You saw him a couple times. All right, so there's a, <laughs> there's a couple other things I want to show you. Oh, 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 this. Okay, Bigfoot snowshoes. All right, so this is from the 1970s. That is a vintage piece from the 1970s. 
as advertised on TV, it says. Right, KTEL. So if you grew up in the 70s, you know what KTEL is. There was a lot of commercials for KTEL project, KTEL products. And this is a KTEL product. And you can see this uh, there, artwork. Well, here, here's a kid following in Bigfoot's footsteps right there. But then if you turn it around, see that's in the snow, but you can also use it on the beach. And here it is on the beach, on the reverse side. Now Bigfoot's following the kid. So snowshoes, and they can also be used on the beach. They're big plastic feet that's strapped to your, your boots. Here's some Ben Cooper Bigfoot costumes. This is Ben Cooper, the famous Halloween costume company. You can see it there. It says Bigfoot. And I have a few different versions of this. Let me see if I can take this one out of it. So here's, oh, that does anything for you, seeing how the bag pretty much the same. It's Bigfoot. Okay. This was $3.50 originally. Here's the mask. Well, I'm not going to take the costume out. <laughs> There's no place to put anything. There we go. Nah, I'm not going to take the costume out. Here's what the costume looks like. You can get a taste of it there. And this is actually Bigfoot from the Sid and Marty Croft Bigfoot and Wild Boy Bigfoot and Wild Boy TV show. So in the 70s there was a Saturday morning live action TV show called Bigfoot and Wild Boy. I actually, believe it or not, didn't I did not watch that show. Watched a lot of other similar shows. I didn't watch that show. I don't know why. You would think I would have been all over that show, but no, I didn't watch it. But these costumes don't say Bigfoot and Wild Boy. I, I have seen what the whole costume looks like. It doesn't say Bigfoot and Wild Boy, it just says Bigfoot. The only way you know that it's Bigfoot and Wild Boy is the little, little copyright notice at the bottom. Like this copyright in the box, you can see it says, oh, Said and Marty Croft, 1977. But the the main text that you, that's actually visible on the costume says nothing about that. It just says Bigfoot. So I think they were hedging their bets that not everyone who bought the costume would be familiar with the show, but every little boy at that time definitely knew what Bigfoot was and might want to be Bigfoot for Halloween. Here is, let's take this one out of the package. Here's the Harry Scary version. And this is also Sid and Marty Croft copyright. Let me see if it's the same, same thing. So the mask is completely different. The mask is not the same mask at all. Different mask with hair on it. And the costume, I think it's the same costume. Um, this is about to fall off my lap. I'm going to put this away. Too much stuff out at one time.
But like I said, I've got... I have other versions of this costume. These are the two that were hand. I saw them sitting over there, so I thought, oh, there they are right there. I better, better show those. But I have other ones stored away. Whew. All right, there's still other things I want to show you. Okay. <laughs> Well, this is a Don Post Studios Yeti mask. Now, this was originally introduced in the 70s, but then they changed it. It had originally had sharp teeth, and the mouth didn't go in as far. And they changed it to give it uh, more blunt teeth and more of a mouth. But this is a Yeti, and he still has his tag. Let's see if I can get this over here. Here you can see his tag. There's the mask. I'd love to have a 70s one. This is the early 80s version. Love to have a 70s one. I mean it looks almost the same but to a mask collector you know subtle differences mean a lot. So the 70s one had more of an aggressive look. It was almost identical, but just little subtle differences made a, made a big difference in the impression that it gave you. I think the 70s one might be molded in black rubber, and this is molded in tan rubber. And uh, it's got that old Dom Post hair on it. So I remember looking at uh, the 70s version of this in... Oh, I never showed you the... Oh gosh, it's covered in dust. So this is a Goosebumps key ring. I just, there are a few other things I skipped along the way, but might as well show you that. That's like a 90s piece. But there's, um, I'll put this thing. So I, the, I saw the 70s version of this advertised in Famous Monsters, the Filmland magazine. Don Post uh, ran full page ads in Famous Monsters and I remember seeing the ads for the 70s Yeti mask pictured there, and I wanted one as a kid, but they were like 40 bucks or whatever. They were, at that time, that was a lot of money. It's ridiculous. So, of course, I never got one. So, as an adult, I definitely wanted to have one. So, I got this. It would be nice to have the 70s one, though. It's, it's cool to have this one, but I'd like to have the 70s one. They're harder to find. Okay, so I got one more mask to show you, and I think we'll wrap it up. Okay, I have one more thing to show you. And this is by no means all of the Bigfoot or Yeti or Nessie stuff I own. I, I have more than this. This is just what I'm able to get my hands on, starting with those two boxes I picked off a shelf over there. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to show this, I better show this, I better show this. So if it was easy for me to... If I knew right where it was and it was easy to get it, I, I did, like the Bionic Bigfoot and the, the Ben Cooper masks. But there's other things I have. Um, I have a Marx battery-operated Yeti, which is a very classic 60s toy. I have the box, I have the, the Yeti. Uh, but I think I'll save him for a Marx episode sometime in the future. Um, for one thing, his... His box is all bubble wrapped up, and the toy is, all, is in like, tissue and then bubble wrap over that. I mean, it would just have to take so much stuff off. And uh, Better to have an episode maybe where I have all the Marx robot monsters displayed, and I can talk about each one. So I'll save that for the future. But this is the last thing I'm going to show you. Make sure my mic is on. Yep, it's on. Okay. Um. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so uh, Distortions Unlimited made this mask called a Snow Beast in. Uh, 
think it was the 70s. I don't know. I don't know if it was 70s or 80s. But anyway, they made this cool mask called a Snow Beast. And I believe the original was sculpted by Ed Edmonds. I don't have the original. I would like to. I don't have one. Uh, but several years ago, they did a limited run of reissue masks, but they didn't put out the very same ones. They didn't put out the same sculpts. Uh, a very talented, well-known sculptor named Jordu. Uh, if you ever watched Making Monsters, that was a, a show that was on for a while. Uh, behind the scenes at Distortions Unlimited, uh, you would have seen Jordu on that show. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you probably saw that show. If not, I think they're all online. If you search, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, his name's Jordu Shell. If I'm pronouncing that right, Jordu Shell. And he sculpted new versions of some of the classic distortions masks from the 70s and 80s. And so he sculpted a new Snow Beast, which is what I have in here. And these things were very limited. I don't remember how many they made of each one, but I didn't buy any other ones. I just bought the Snow Beast. They were not uh, cheap. As I recall, they're a little pricey, so it wasn't something the casual collector would, would buy. Uh, that's why I don't have a shelf full of distortions, uh, reissue masks. They weren't called reissues. What, were they, what did they call those things? Oh, they had a, had a good term for it. They were, they're re-sculpts, they're not the same, they're not the original sculpts. Uh, what was it called? Resurrection, that was it, I think, yeah. Uh, the Distortions Resurrection line. <clears throat> and now, this one's pretty sought after. For something that's not that old, it's surprisingly, uh, its, it's resale value is surprisingly high. I don't have any plans to sell this one though. I'd like to get the original one and have them side by side. So this is the box that was shipped in, and I don't think, I think I've taken it out of this box one time when it first arrived, and not since. So let's see. Can I just lift this bag up? No, I better not do that. Ah. Oh. Okay. Oh, this is stuffed. All right. I don't know if I've ever had this <laughs> plastic off. So I don't think I have. Oh dear, do I want to have plastic off? Uh. Okay. Ah. All right now. Yikes. So there he is. There's the Distortions Unlimited Resurrection Series Snow Beast sculpted by Jordu Shell. I don't even want to touch it. <laughs> don't want to get dirt on it. Let's put it back in here. Okay. Got a lot of blood on them. Okay. Well, I will put him properly away in a second. Ah, <sighs> okay. So I think that concludes. <laughs> that concludes our look at cryptozoology monsters. Bigfoot, the Loch Ness monster, the abominable snowman. And there's another episode I did where we looked at the Tom Land Famous Monsters of Legend series. Don't know if I'm going to upload this before or after that one. So maybe, maybe it hasn't been uploaded yet, but if not, then it's coming. And that's an 8-inch Mego style figure of the Abominable Snowman. So there's that too. And if I keep thinking, I'm sure I'll come up with other... Bigfoot Yeti toys. I know I've got 
some other stuffed Bigfoots, different kinds of stuffed Bigfoots. I've got Harry and the Hendersons toys. Oh boy, what else do I have? Of course I have the Marks Yeti that I mentioned. I've got all kinds of books, lots of books, lots of Yeti books. In fact, do I have any here? No, not, or do I? Yeah, a couple. Um, I have some in there, in that bookcase. I, I've got a lot of stuff. So, uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive look at everything that was made or everything that I have in my collection. There's still some things I'd like to have. I'd love to have, uh, speaking of Tomland, the Glow version Yeti on a card. But as, I, as you'll learn when you watch that episode, that's not going to happen because they're thousands of dollars for glow versions on cards. I'd like to have the original Snow Beast mask distortions. I'd like to have the 70s version of the Dawn Post Yeti. Oh, what else? There's a wind-up Marks Yeti. I don't have that. Oh, there's, so, there's all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff that I don't have. Mostly Bigfoot stuff. There's a lot of Bigfoot stuff from the 70s that I don't have. Because Bigfoot was just, the 70s were the era of Bigfoot. I mean, it was, I mean, it was era of Star Wars, era of Six Million Dollar Man, which had Bigfoot in it. And Star Wars had Chewbacca in it, as well as the Wampa. So even these other things had Bigfoot in them in some way that part of the culture permeated other other parts of the culture yeah comic books um I know like in Marvel comics there were there was a Wendigo I don't know what era he's from though but I'm sure that there were some kind of Bigfoot Yeti creatures in in the comic books and I know in the 60s, Johnny Quest had a Yeti. So an Ultraman had a Yeti-type monster. So anywhere you turned, that was out there. Bigfoot, Yeti, Nessie, UFOs, Bermuda Triangle, so on, so on. Haunted houses like the Amityville Horror. Uh, even today, with all of the reality television and the shows like Finding Bigfoot and Killing Bigfoot and Mountain Monsters, uh, Monsters and Mysteries of America, um, Destination Truth, all these, all these things, two-hour specials about the Yeti or, or Bigfoot or looking at DNA, even with all the stuff that's on TV now, it still feels like the 70s were the era of Bigfoot. The Roger Patterson film had come out in the late 60s. What was that, 67, I want to say, the Roger Patterson? Um, it wasn't 68, was it? I want to say 67, I don't know. Um, I think it was, it was 67 or 68, I don't, I don't know. But w then you had The Legend of Boggy Creek in the early 70s, and those two things just were like this uh, big bang poof, that just kept reverberating throughout the decade into the 80s. And it really was part of the culture that, that just like in the late 70s and 80s, you had Star Wars as part of the culture. It, it was pre-Star Wars. It was one of the things that, in Jaws, it was one of the things that really shaped the pop culture of the era. Like disco music, Jaws, Star Wars, Vietnam, Watergate. And Bigfoot. That was a big deal. Bigfoot was a big deal in the 1970s. 
Well, it's going to take me a long time to put all this away. Quite a cleanup ahead of me. But if it entertains someone out there, it was worth it. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll tune in again for another episode of Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. Oh, <laughs>